The story of the King of the Ebony Isles. My father was king of the city which once stood about this palace. He was lord also of the Ebony Isles that are now the four hills which you passed on your way hither. When I succeeded to the throne upon his death, I took to wife my own cousin, the daughter of my uncle, with whom I lived for five years in the utmost confidence and felicity, continually entertained by the charm of her conversation and the beauty of her person, and happy in the persuasion that she found in me an equal satisfaction. One day, however, it chanced, in the hour before dinner when the queen was gone to bathe and adorn herself, that I lay upon a couch beside which two female slaves sat fanning me. And they, supposing me to be asleep, began to talk concerning me and their mistress. Ah! said one, how little our lord knows where our mistress goes to amuse herself every night while he lies dreaming, how should he know? Returned the other, seeing that the cup of wine which she gives him each night contains a sleeping draught, that causes him to sleep sound however long she is absent. Then at daybreak when she returns she burns perfumes under his nostrils, and he waking and finding her there guesses nothing. Pity it is that he cannot know of her treacherous ways, for surely it is a shame that a king's wife should go abroad and mix with base people. Now when I heard this the light of day grew dark before my eyes, but I lay on and made no sign, awaiting my wife's return. And she coming in presently, we sat down and ate and drank together according to custom. And afterwards, when I had retired and lain down, she brought me with her own hands the cup of spiced wine, inviting me to drink. Then I, averting myself, raised it to my lips, but instead of drinking, poured it by stealth into my bosom, and immediately sank down as though overcome by its potency, feigning slumber. Straightway the queen rose up from my side, and having clothed herself in gorgeous apparel and anointed herself with perfumes, she made her way secretly from the palace, and I with equal secrecy followed her. Soon, passing by way of the narrower streets, we arrived before the city gates. And immediately at a word from her the chains fell and the gates opened of their own accord, closing again behind us as soon as we had passed. At last she came to a ruined hut, and there entering I saw her presently with her veil laid aside, seated in familiar converse with a monstrous African, the meanest and most vile of slaves, offering to him in abject servility dainties which she had carried from the royal table, and bestowing upon him every imaginable token of affection and regard. At this discovery I fell into a blind rage, and drawing my sword I rushed in and struck the slave from behind a blow upon the neck that should have killed him. Then believing that I had verily slain him, and before the queen found eyes to realize what had befallen, I departed under cover of night as quickly as I had come, and returned to the palace and my own chamber. On awaking the next morning I found the queen lying beside me as though nothing had happened, and at first I was ready to believe it had all been an evil dream. But presently I perceived her eyes red with weeping, her hair dishevelled, and her face torn by the passion of a grief which she strove to conceal. Having thus every reason to believe that my act of vengeance had not fallen short of its purpose, I held my tongue and made no sign. But the same day at noon, while I sat in council, the queen appeared before me clad in deep mourning, and with many tears informed me how she had received sudden news of the death of her father and mother and two brothers, giving full and harrowing details of each event. Without any show of incredulity I heard her tale, and when she besought my permission to go into retirement and mourn in a manner befitting so great a calamity, I bade her do as she desired. So for a whole year she continued to mourn in a privacy which I left undisturbed, and during that time she caused to be built a mausoleum or temple of lamentation. The same whose dome you see yonder into which she withdrew herself from all society. While I, believing the cause of my anger removed and willing to humour the grief which my act had caused her, waited patiently for her return to a sane and reasonable state of mind. But, as I learned too late, matters had not so fallen, for though in truth the African was grievously wounded, being cut through the gullet and speechless, it was not the will of heaven that he should die. And the queen having by her enchantments kept him in a sort of life, no sooner was the mausoleum finished than she caused him to be secretly conveyed thither, and there night and day tended him, awaiting his full recovery. At length, when two years were over and her mourning in no wise abated, my curiosity became aroused. So going one day to the Temple of Lamentation I entered unannounced, and placing myself where I might see and not be seen, there I discovered her in an abandonment of fond weeping over her miserable treasure whose very life was a dishonour to us both. 
but no sooner in my just resentment had I started to upbraid her, than she is now for the first time realizing the cause of her companion's misfortune. Began to heap upon me terms of the most violent and shameful abuse. And when, carried beyond myself, I threatened her with my sword, she stood up before me, and having first uttered words of unknown meaning she cried. Be thou changed in a moment span. Half be marble, and half be man. And at the word I became even as you see me now dead to the waist, and above living yet bound. Yet even so her vengeance was not satisfied. Having reduced me to this state she went on to vent her malice upon the city and islands over which I ruled, and the unfortunate people who were my subjects. Thus by her wicked machinations the city became a lake, and the islands about it the four hills which you have seen. As for the inhabitants, who were of four classes and creeds, Muslims, Christians, Jews, and Persians, she turned them into fish of four different colors. The white are the Muslims, the red are Persian fire worshippers, the yellow are Jews, and the blue Christians. And now having done all this she fails not every day to inflict upon me a hundred lashes with a whip which draws blood at every stroke, and when these are accomplished she covers my torn flesh with hair cloth and lays over it these rich robes in mockery. Of a surety it is the will of heaven that I should be the most miserable and despised of mortals. Thus the youth finished his story, nor when he had ended could he refrain from tears. The sultan also was greatly moved when he heard it, and his heart became full of a desire to avenge such injuries upon the doer of them. Tell me, he said, where is now this monster of iniquity? Sir, answered the youth, I doubt not she is yonder in the mausoleum with her companion, for thither she goes daily so soon as she has measured out to me my full meed of chastisement, and as for this day my portion has been served to me, I am quit of her till tomorrow brings, the hour of fresh scourgings. Now when this was told him the sultan saw his way plain. Be of good cheer, he said to the youth, and endure with a quiet spirit yet once more the affliction she causes thee. For at the price of that single scourging I trust, by the will of heaven, to set thee free. So on the morrow the sultan lay in close hiding until sounds reached him which told that the whippings had begun. Then he arose and went in haste to the mausoleum, where amid rich hangings and perfumes and the illumination of a thousand candles, he found the black slave stretched mute upon a bed awaiting in great feebleness the recovered use of his sawn gullet. Quickly, with a single sword stroke, the avenger took from him that poor remnant of life which enchantment alone had made possible. Then having thrown the body into a well in the courtyard below, he lay down in the dead man's place, drawing the coverlet well over him. Soon after, fresh from her accustomed task of cruelty, the enchantress entered, and falling upon her knees beside the bed she cried, Has my lord still no voice wherewith to speak to his servant? Surely, for lack of that sound, hearing lies withered within me. Then the sultan, taking to himself the thick speech of an African, said, There is no strength or power but in God alone. On hearing those words, believing that her companion's speech was at last restored to him, the queen uttered a cry of joy. But scarcely had she begun to lavish upon him the tokens of her affection when the pretended African broke out against her in violent abuse. What? He cried, Dost thou expect favor at my hands, when it is because of thee that for two years I have lain dumb and prostrate? How darest thou speak to me or look for any recompense save death? Nay. He went on in answer to her astonished protests, Have not the cries and tears and groans of thy husband kept me continually from rest, and has not heaven smitten me for no other reason than because thou wouldst not cease from smiting him? So has the curse which thou didst seek to lay upon him fallen doubly upon me? Alas, cried the enchantress, have I unknowingly caused thee so great an ill? If it be so, then let my lord give command, and whatever be his desire it shall be satisfied. Then said the sultan, Go instantly and release thy husband from spell and torment, and when it is done, return hither with all speed. Thus compelled, in great fear and bewilderment and sorely against her will, the queen sped to the chamber in the palace where her husband lay spell bound. Taking a vessel of water she pronounced over it certain words which caused it instantly to boil as though it had been set on a fire. Then throwing the water over him, she cried, Spell be loosed, and stone grow warm, yield back flesh to the human form. And immediately on the word his nature came to him again, and he leaped and stood upon his feet. But the queen's hatred towards him was by no means abated. Go hence quickly, she cried, since a better will than mine releases thee. But if thou tarry or if thou return, thou shalt surely die. 
Thankful for his deliverance the youth stayed not to question, but departing went and hid himself without, while the queen returned in haste to the mausoleum where her supposed lover awaited her. There, eager for restoration to favor, she informed him of what she had done, supposing that to be all. Nay, said the other, still speaking with the thick voice of an African, though thou hast lopped the branch of the evil thou hast not destroyed the root. For every night I hear a jumping of fishes in the lake that is between the four hills, and the sound of their curses on thee and me comes to disturb my rest. Go instantly and restore all things to their former state, then come back and give me thy hand and I shall rise up a sound man once more. Rejoicing in that promise and the expectations it held out to her of future happiness, the queen went with all speed to the border of the lake. There taking a little water into her hand, and uttering strange words over it, she sprinkled it this way and that upon the surface of the lake and the roots of the four hills, and immediately where had been the lake a city appeared, and instead of fishers inhabitants, and in place of the four hills four islands. As for the palace it stood no longer removed far away into the desert but upon a hill overlooking the city. Great was the astonishment of the vizier and the sultan's escort which had lain encamped beside the lake to find themselves suddenly transported to the heart of a populous city, with streets and walls and the hum of reawakened life around them. But a greater and more terrible shock than this awaited the queen upon her return to the mausoleum to enjoy the reward of her labours. Now, she cried, let my lord arise, since all that he willed is accomplished. Give me thy hand, said the sultan, still in a voice of disguise, come nearer that I may lean on thee. And as she approached he drew forth his sword which had lain concealed beside him in the bed, and with a single blow cleft her wicked body in twain. Then he rose and went quickly to where in hiding lay the young king her husband, who learned with joy of the death of his cruel enemy. He thanked the sultan with tears of gratitude for his deliverance, and invoked the blessings of heaven upon him and his kingdom. On yours too, said the Sultan, let peace and prosperity now reign. And since your city is so near to mine, come with me and be my guest that we may rejoice together in the bonds of friendship. Nay, answered the young king, that would I do willingly, but your country lies many a day's journey from my own. I fear the breaking of the spell which held me and my subjects has brought you further than you wished. It was in fact true that the Ebony Isles had now returned to the place from which they had originally come. The sultan put a smiling face upon the matter. I can well put up with the tedium of my journey, said he, if only you will be my companion. Nay, let me speak frankly to one whose demeanor in affliction has won my heart. I am childless and have no heir. Come with me and be my son, and when I am dead unite our two kingdoms under a single ruler. The young king, who had conceived for his deliverer an equal affection, could not withstand so noble and generous an offer, and so with a free exchange of hearts on both sides the matter was arranged. After a journey of some months the sultan arrived again at his own capital, where he was welcomed with great rejoicings by the people, who had long mourned over his strange and unexplained absence. As for the old fisherman who had been the immediate cause of the young king's deliverance the sultan loaded him with honours and gave his daughters in marriage to sons of the blood royal, so that they all continued in perfect happiness and contentment to the end of their days. <laughs>